Um, welcome all, and thanks to the first session today of, of, Map, of Map Camp. Today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and why context is your crown jewels. I struggle with that sentence. Why context is your crown jewels? And I've got Petra Vukmirovic. Is that correct, Petra? I practiced that and got it right the first time. <laughs> um, so Petra, why don't you introduce yourself and let's dive in and start going. I've got a few people who clearly are excited and ready to, ready to go complaining there's no talk happening. Okay, so hello, good morning everyone, happy Tuesday. I'm just going to share my screen now and start my presentation and then I can introduce myself as well. Give me one second. And there we go. So hello, I am Petra Um and uh, I'm here to give you a talk on why context is your crown jewels with my little twist of um, basically getting to know your sharks. So just a little bit about me. Um, I am by background an emergency medicine doctor. I, I was also um, on the COVID frontline in March uh, recently, but um, as of recent, most importantly, I am the cybersecurity engineer in Glasgow, so <laughs> that might come as a surprise to many people, um, but I just want to say how. Well, one of the things was um, with a little help from my friends, and that is Worldly Maps. Basically, for my interview, uh, as part of the job application in Glasgow, I had to do a Worldly Map. Um, which kind of sealed the deal and nailed me uh, a job, <laughs> which is great. I then had to also show that worldly map in front of the whole company, which was quite fun too. Um, but yeah, there we go. Worldly maps um, kind of paving the path towards people's careers. Um, and of course, it took me a lot of hard work and determination to uh, change my career and get me where I am now. Um, so again, a little bit about me, just all the stuff that I'm doing right now. So emergency medicine, um, I'm a master's student in information security, um, and I'm also an athlete. So I can bring you um, some insight from different angles to um, this talk as well. So just a little joke, I inject humans and web apps too. <laughs> this was actually the first worldly map that uh, sealed me the interview, but I'm not here to talk about that today. Um, Right, so why do we need to know the context, right? So basically, um, if we're thrown into an ocean, um, as you see on the picture here, um, it's really actually important to know the waters that we're swimming in, right? So, you know, it's, it's valid to know, are we swimming with sharks or are we swimming with dolphins? Um, it's also worth knowing where the land on the horizon is. Like, is it east, north, south? So where are we going to swim towards to, to save ourselves? Um, and then once we know our context, then we can actually figure out what we need to kind of, you know, save ourselves in this situation. So if we have sharks swimming around us, obviously we don't want to be on paddle boards like these two guys. Uh, we want a proper boat, right? But if we have got dolphins and the land is quite near, we're going to be actually quite happy paddling away. So... That's just a little bit about how context can kind of change the situation. Now, also context is not important, obviously, um, only in cybersecurity. It's actually something that's embedded. Um, the importance of context is embedded in many professions. One of the professions is my previous profession, and that will be emergency medicine. Also, it's important in aviation, um, which actually, you know, um, a lot of simulations in regards to aviation and emergency medicine come hand to hand. And people actually, you know, simulate um, situations where they practice context. So, as I said, it's trained extensively. Um, but, you know, it, the good thing about cybersecurity is that you can do simulations in many ways and it's much easier than doing them in aviation or medicine. And actually, worldly maps can be some sort of simulation. It's actually a theoretical simulation. And then it replicates your context and it replicates the climate that your business is in. 
So um, that way it helps you form a strategy. So just think about that for a bit. Um, okay, so I'm going to present you now a map that I made for this. Um, a lot of times in cybersecurity, we talk about vulnerabilities. Um, people get very focused on those because they keep popping up all the time. Um, we use a lot of dependencies in our softwares. Um, these dependencies need upgrading. They become vulnerable quite often. And then it becomes even at a lot of points for a cybersecurity engineer or an analyst, very overwhelming to see um, you know, how are we going to approach the vulnerability management? We have a lot of scores, um, we have a lot of approaches, um, but it's, it's never a straightforward thing. It's never black and white. So we can actually also kind of think about the context that these vulnerabilities are in, and we can use worldly maps to help us guide the way to see how we're going to manage those. Right. So one thing that I've started doing this summer is trying to think of a reverse worldly map methodology because in worldly maps we always use the users as an anchor um, but you know in cybersecurity sometimes things are different sometimes we just have to think like an attacker not like our user which is you know quite often we do that in cybersecurity so why not implement that into a worldly map so I thought about that and I thought, okay, so let's think about an attacker. Let's figure out the attacker's needs. So also which context is the attacker in? Um, and once we know that, we can actually make sure that we strip those needs away from the attacker, from the bad guy. Right, so here we go. I'm gonna show you my map. So we got this attacker. He is a black hack hacker and he is also a very smart and skilled one, okay? Because, you know, these days we got loads of attackers. We got, you know, the script kiddies, which are basically beginners. We got attackers who will just use OSINT tools, which is open source intelligence tools um, to hack us. We got social engineers, um, which will just use a low techie way to actually penetrate our systems. So for my kind of demonstration, I chose, you know, a very skilled and smart black hack hacker who's got a lot of techie skills. Right, so what does an attacker need? Well, it needs vulnerable software, right? And then the other thing that an attacker needs is a hacking framework, which is a hacker's tools, um, you know, a computer, a system, everything. For example, one of the hacking frameworks that is most popular is called Metasploit and it has like a lot of scanning tools embedded. It's got um, exploits in that you can dump straight away. So um, that's just an example. All right. So talking about context, we've got this vulnerable software, but it's not just the vulnerable software that it needs, right? Because um, software by itself can be vulnerable, but it can still be impenetrable. So for this software, we need some open ports and we need some publicly facing IPs for the attacker to even be able to, you know, get to know that this software exists, um, to even reach it. Right, and then as a commodity, we got internet access, which is a utility. Now, as you see, all of this is on the right of my worldly map. And that's because vulnerable software is, you know, something that's very, very common. Um, so it's, it's pretty much something that's industrialized because a lot of software these days will have vulnerabilities. Um, as soon as a new patch comes out, it takes a couple of months and they can get some vulnerabilities. Um, and also open ports, pub publicly facing IPs, something that's, you know, just necessary for software to function most these days. Internet access, again, is a utility, so it's all on the right on my worldly map. So if we think about it, we've got that on the right for a black hat hacker. These are the things that are quite easily accessible. And then we go a little bit to the left and we've got the hacking framework. And then we've got the known exploits as well. Because of course, it's not just necessary for a vulnerability to be present, it's necessary for a known exploit. And this is where we're getting close to our, uh, you know, explanation of context and why it matters here. So 
basically, as I said, we got all of these things on the right, and then we got our zero day exploit on the left. Now, the zero day exploit is on the left because it's just a bespoke thing. It's custom made. Um, it's not something that's been done before, and it's, it depends on the you know high, high skills of a hacker to actually sit down and write some code and write an exploit. So this is where we're getting at. So we got a vulnerability of our software. Um, and you know the instinct in a lot of times is just to like rush in and try and patch that vulnerability. But actually, if we think about the context, is this vulnerability exploitable? Do, is this actually, you know, is it a database that's actually not even connected to the internet? Because in that scenario, if we strip away the internet access, we don't even need to patch the vulnerability. We can just strip away the internet access and that's easier, right, than just paying developers to sit down for hours patching some systems. Also, we can close some ports. Maybe that will help to just reduce our risk. So this is all about the context where our software lies in and how we're going to approach actually this vulnerability. Also on the right, as you see, so these are the things that the hacker has readily available, but also the things that is easy for us to take away. But if we can't, or if we've already done that, but we want to, you know, security in depth, then we can think about like, okay, so there's some known exploits out there. Um, we can't take really those away, but um, we can also think about, for example, zero day exploit. Some people think, oh, it's impossible to take that away, but there's also methods for that too. One of the methods is like content disarm and reconstruction, where we basically make sure that any files have, um, don't have any unknown malware. So it is also a strategy that we can go for um, if we want security in depth. And if it's something that, you know, we've already addressed all the other bits of our worldly map. So there we go. That's a little bit about like how we can use, you know, how we have to put everything into context and we, how we have to, how we can use uh, worldly maps to um, actually reveal the context. Because sometimes we, okay, we're aware that we have to think about it, but we, we're not really sure how to visualize it to ourselves. So it could be a way to do that. Um, so I also wanted to show you, um, there's another map that I've made uh, and it's also similar to context. I kind of imagined um, that we can also do threat modeling with worldly maps and I wanted to make it a bit fun. So I decided to do a threat modeling of COVID itself. Well, actually not COVID as per se, but more as like the virus, like coronavirus. So, what does coronavirus need to become COVID, to become the disease? Um, so again, I'm putting the attacker here as a user. I'm doing this reverse methodology because then again, we can think about stripping away the attacker's needs. And as here it says, we got like cr our crowded places. We got our healthy individuals. Uh, we got our individuals at risk on the left side, we got hygiene habits on the right. So that was pre-locked, that was pre-summer, that was during the harshest lockdown that this worldly map was made. So, you know, obviously all the crowded places and everything was on the left because that wasn't existent at the time. It was a very rare thing to, you know, if it was crowded, it was illegal. Um, but then in the context, so that's, that was that context of pre-lockdown. But then if you think about it, for summer 2020, the whole context has changed. And like we have, again, crowded places to the right side now. And we have healthy individuals who travel on the right. We've got airlines on the right. So everything's moved to the right. And again, how are we going to strip the virus's needs? What strategy is the government going to take? Again, going back to our black hat hacker, it's easiest to take away their most readily available needs, right? So let's, you know, try and reduce the crowded places. Let's reduce the healthy individuals who travel, introduce quarantines. So again, as you see, we can also, if we put things into context and worldly maps, we can also think of a strategy um, on how to cope, how, what is the easiest thing that we can do to make a biggest effect first. And that comes to the end of my presentation. Um, and I thank you for your attention. And it's time for discussion and questions. Brilliant, Petra. 
really brilliant start to the day. Um, I, I've, I've, I, if you don't mind, I jump, uh, if I could jump in and ask a question on that. And sure. everybody feel free uh, to use the q and I should have said that at the beginning, um, just to put in any questions you have. Um, and I'll read them out. Um, yeah, first is that changing context. Um, when I started mapping, the biggest problem I had was deciding what were, what the axes were. So I may have a specific thing I wanted to study and it was, okay, there's so many different things to consider. How do I pick the right one? Um, in my work, I tend to map for other people. So I'm mapping for customers to try to understand the solutions of things they're doing. I'm wondering what if you could just talk a little bit about the experience of changing context and what's difficult about that um, from the point of view of deciding what you're measuring, what you're actually looking at. Yeah, so um, as you see where I changed context is actually, yeah, I put the black hat hacker here because mm -hmm. If we think about in cybersecurity, a lot of times, if we think about our users, um, yes, it's important, but a lot of times when we think about business and strategy and our customers, um, we of course want to fulfill this customer's needs, but cybersecurity in a way it's different because it's more, it's not so much about doing something actively, it's actually preventative. So in a way we still, you know, if we're going to be preventative, um, we have to think about what are we preventing against and where are we, you know, where are we going to put our efforts in? And this is where I kind of thought that, you know, putting our black hacker as our user here would be better because that's basically what we do in penetration testing as well. We, you know, we place ourselves as an attacker rather than actually um, addressing our customers and addressing our users, which I know it's a little bit different. So yeah, changing context can be difficult because we can be very much stuck in kind of our constant ways of thinking and, you know, this is how it is and this is how it has been. But if we want to make um, some progression, then I think sometimes it's better to change that context, put ourselves into you know, make our anchor a bit different and see how we can change angles to make ourselves more efficient. Oh, you're muted, Damien. Had to happen once, it might happen again. <laughs> um, Philippe Gonet, and speaking of context, anybody putting in a question, feel free to write who you are and why you're asking, maybe your domain. Um, just to give us a little bit of context and make sure you get the, the answer you're looking for. But a question from Philip Gonet, um, in which way have those maps told you something you didn't already know? Um, so what did you learn or what was revealed by the maps as you went along? So I think in this scenario, I know sometimes it can seem like, oh, um, you know, we're discovering, we're not discovering, uh, you know, a new continent here. Um, but I think it's more about what I mentioned earlier. It's more about simulation and just kind of making us aware of our context. Because as I said, sometimes we can get so focused on actually trying to, for example, fight zero day exploits and just kind of being aware of those and trying to cope with those and patching our vulnerabilities. Well, I think making this map actually shows us more of, well, actually, if we do something super easy and that's like remove internet access from a database and we can still use our software, Actually, that way we can, with much less effort, patch a vulnerability than like, for example, paying some developer to sit down for seven hours and try and patch all the systems. So in that way, I think it revealed something that we didn't, it's not so much that it revealed something that we didn't know, but it's more kind of putting our situation in context and guiding us through the way to um, figure out what's our next step in vulnerability management. Brilliant. Uh, Sarah or Dennis, do you have any advice uh, or questions for Petra just around what you've heard? I wouldn't presume to give Petra advice in this in this space. Um, <laughs> um, I, I just want to back her up completely in terms of the value add. I mean, certainly, I mean, she, she's brought you um, sort of simple elegance. I'm going to be bringing you chaos at scale. Um, <laughs> um, so ways to either 
see the um, additional perspectives you may not be focused on because you're in your silo, very focused in on your specialist area is, is incredibly valuable. Um, and, and from my point of view, trying to strip away some of the layers so you can focus in the way Petra has. So I think it, it works from both perspectives. Fantastic. Dennis? Yeah, I'm, I'm the guilty one of, of getting Petra to have done that um, worldly map because I'm the one who put on the recruitment process that we did, the, the worldly maps you know, requirement, which I highly recommend. You know, it was a major success story for us to actually put worldly maps as part of the recruitment process. So, uh, you know, as you can see that, you know, it was a great way to see Petra in action, but also to see her thinking on this. So, uh, and I'm very privileged to have Petra as a member of my team. Well, I think we're going to have to ask you about that whole process of uh, inserting Woodley mapping as part of a hiring process. I think there's a whole story there. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. James Abley, um, do you find that you need to map attackers at different levels of, abstra of abstraction? Um, you mean like um, for every attacker that has a different level, do a new worldly map? It, if that's the question, then yes. Um, I think that every level of attacker deserves its own worldly map. Um, if that was the question, if that makes sense. That's well, okay. That's one interpretation. I, I would have interpreted it, um, the so the levels of abstraction. So you can have the same hacker, but effectively, are there different ways you can view that same threat or different or that same hacker? Not knowing the domain itself, uh, maybe that's a bad interpretation. I don't know, Sarah or Dennis, if you'd have a different interpretation of that question. No, so I'm going to go with your interpretation <laughs> <laughs> and assume you answered it correctly. James, correct us if you if um, if if you can add any context to that question. Um, excellent presentation. Have you applied you. The same for ethical hacking? Um, and businesses uses knowledge and awareness being a vulnerability. So what I don't know about the, the threat, how, uh, you know, have you, have you, yeah, that's a really good question, actually. Have you mapped the deficiency of understanding of users as a vulnerability in itself? Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a vulnerability. I mean, you know, we can patch our software as much as we want, but, um, sometimes the lack of knowledge of users is definitely a vulnerability. So yeah, that's a really good point. That that should come onto this map. That's um it is also something that a black hat hacker, you know, a lot of times needs is just um you know users not being aware how to use that software and them making themselves and the software vulnerable just by doing that. So yeah, good point. Um, so sorry. can I just add a point on, on this yeah. one? I, I think when you do a map, right, I think it's very important that you have a specific scenario at hand, right? You know, the scenario that you pick up almost determine how you look at the maps. And then in, in a nutshell, the maps is basically a sequence or, you know, a value chain or a sequence of events. This leads to this, this to this, or this has this or needs this, etc. And then basically four levels of evolution that, um, you know, you need to be creative on it, right? I, th I think a lot of maps, you know, you, you see Genesis custom build product and commodity, but if you look at that big table that Simon has, right, there is, there's lots of different ways to slice this. And I'll show some examples on my presentation of, you know, it's about the telling the story, right? And that's how I view it, right? The, 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 you want to tell a story with a map and when you're thinking maps, you know, you basically are, you know, moving things in your head of, you know, um, you know, or are you trying to understand what happens if, you know, this goes to the right or what will happen, you know, when, you know, something evolves, what, what happens then? And, and I think that's one of the most, actually, there's a question on gameplays and, and things are what happens, right? I, I find that that's probably the most value I get from maps is to really understand that things will co-evolve, things will change, that as soon as something reach a level of product or commodity, there's a whole bunch of other things that will occur. So you can think of that from an attacker. Once an attacker reaches a certain level, there's other things that, you know, almost game that has been unlocked, right? Or other innovations or other things that they can do. 
Yeah, I would, I would second that. Um, in my context, mapping for customers typically to try and um, try and fail fast, right? To work out the customer projects that make no sense and actually will be a cost to me as a salesperson. And what I often find is that the real value um, is less around the map, more around the conversation. It's a tool that helps me to unsimplify some of the things that as part of just the course of thinking about things, you'll tend to wrap things up, think about them in terms of maybe two or three components. Um, when I then actually map something, I'll realize, wow, there are eight or nine things that are important, not just the three that I focus on from day to day. So it's almost yeah. a tool for allowing me to sort of, um, yeah, de de-simplify <laughs> things that have, uh, have unnecessarily been simplified before. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, do we have um, maybe in one more minute? I just want to also mention one thing. Please. Right. So also talking about context. Um, on this picture before, this one, um, what I also want to mention is, because uh, we've got a moment, is so this picture looks very chaotic, right? And, you know, um, some, some people would say, well, you know, these people are on it. They think like they know what they're doing because um, everyone's busy, everyone's doing their own thing. Everyone just kind of knows what to do. But actually in the context of what this is, so this is a major trauma call where there's a trauma team handling a patient. Actually, this is very wrong um, because every individual knows what they're doing, yes, but there's no one leading the whole call. So there's no person standing at the patient's bed, you know, kind of, directing the call and having this situational awareness um, of the whole situation and you know knows knowing the context because every single individual can be doing the wrong thing but if they're not perfectly synchronized if they're not aware of their context they actually might be doing something very wrong and for example moving the patient wrong and then you know causing more damage than actually um, you know than, than actually good so um, I think, you know, this picture, even though it looks quite organized, um, it's actually very chaotic. And uh, there's, you know, th th there's no, the context here is not, it's foggy. No one's aware of it. So um, this is why I think, you know, also in, you know, in business, but in medicines, it's, yes, everyone knows, needs to know what they're doing, but we need to also know the context that we're actually engaged in. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Petra. Um, really good start, as I said, um, and actually such an interesting subject area. I have probably a hundred questions for you just on your map around COVID um, and just what you've seen around sort of some of the decision making and if there's anything that perhaps could have been exposed through that. But I think that's a little bit um, analogous to the, to, the, to the conversation today. I um, want to introduce Sarah Clark now. Um, who's got a presentation for us. Sarah, what are you going to be talking to us about today? Well, I'm going to be talking about something where you know, apparently I was the problem that Wardley Maps is the solution in search of. Um, I've been de dealing with governance, risk and compliance at scale and trying to simplify that. Um, but I'm going to talk about a very specific corner of that now, which is my role in vendor governance and um, trying to head people off at the past buying pass when they're trying to buy systems to solve people problems and the difficulty in articulating why that isn't the best value add for a given point in time or for a given context so in that context is absolutely everything and that's what I'm hoping to demonstrate today first the way I came to the conclusion very very painfully um, a different way and how I think it could have saved me thousands of words and a lot of pictures to maybe do it with a map so that's me. Brilliant, let's go. Okay, let's get this up properly. And present. Okay, is that on screen for everybody? Not for me. Uh, let's do this. Oh, it says screen sharing has failed to start. Let me just find out, see if there's a reason why. Okay, um, Petra, did you unscreen share? Great, just checking. 
this will be a theme of the day. Um, so <laughs> where you would normally go to a conference and see people rushing around because there hadn't been a, you know, there hadn't been a nice sequence move from one place to another. This is us just trying to bring that um, real world experience online for you. Right. Okay. <laughs> Let me just try that again. There we go. I think that's worked that time. Yes, we see hellfire. Hellfire raining down, yeah. Um, well, I was going to introduce myself very briefly first. Um, that's me. Um, I, the context of this talk more specifically is um, in the early days of GDPR, I just uh, turned around to focus um, unlike many, I wasn't there to just cash in on, on the frenzy. What I, what I was doing was trying to bring some of the transferable um, lessons from me doing cybersecurity governance at scale, because I could see it coming down the pipe at everyone trying to do data protection. So I was, I was coming to bring my lessons learned. And in scoping those programs, there, were, there was um, a massive focus on one of the core requirements, which was to be able to list the kind of personal data processing you were doing. And the temptation was enormous with an awful lot of um, supportive communication from those marketing tools um, to say, let's get something that automatically crawls the network to find personal data because it's, some, it, it's doing something, it's solving a problem. But is it? Is it the right thing to do? I very, very strongly felt from all my experience in this game that it was not the right thing to do at that point in time. And this is, this is talking about that journey and how mapping might have helped me have those communications so um yeah so this is the context in which people are going please give me some tin that does the job for me please please that help me find the personal data and put it into a record of processing activity which was the compliance requirement driving people towards automated data discovery um as you'll note here it isn't just finding data though a record of um, processing activity needs you to understand Who's accountable for that data? Are you transferring it to other places? How securely are you looking after it? When are you going to stop retaining it? What kind of data is it? How sensitive is it? And, and these are the mandatory things to include. A couple of them, they're optional. You can put as much about retention and security as you can reasonably understand when you first log those entries. So is that where we want to go? And this is the other thing that usually scuppered people and um, they didn't know what was a priority. They didn't know how to prioritize. They couldn't see their whole scope. Um, and um, the, the vast majority of folk focused on containers. They focused on a list of servers, something in the um, configuration management database to, to work out about data. But, you know, that tin doesn't understand the context of why you've got that data. Where is it coming from? Where is it going to? So, again, a lot of people spent an age trying to gather information about data insistence and it still didn't give them the intelligent information they needed. There's also this context, this is my amateur artwork, um, perhaps there wasn't yet the motivation and understanding that we needed to change something or perhaps something else took the focus from the business that they need, decided was more of a priority to focus on. So there was a lot of dependency on where you were in this kind of cycle of how the budget holders were viewing what you were trying to achieve within the business as well. And this is this is my version of, a, of, of the map of the of the challenge with this this automated data discovery. This was this was almost um, sanity preserving work. I took my crayons and I drew this out and then I designed it in PowerPoint. It's essentially telling us that you, you scan for personal data and you find it, but is it personal? Do you know? You have to find someone to check with. You have to have the knowledge or be trained or have someone who knows. Um, did you find someone? Is the purpose for processing it clear? Because when you do a record of processing activity, it's not about um, what the data is. It's about why have you got it? That everything hangs off. Why do you have that data? What are you planning to do with it? Does anybody know that? Can you find somebody? Um, is If you found that out, are you doing this compliantly? Is it appropriate? Is it optimized for purpose? Do you know? No, you're gonna, you can't drive that knowledge out of the data protection function. You need to talk to the business. Um, and if it's not, if you don't have an appropriate purpose and you're not doing it compliantly, you're gonna have to fix that problem. If you are doing it compliantly, you log it for your future use. So it's a massive picture that all joins up and the tool is only gonna solve a part of this. And then there's all the other context questions. 
So that's a question about, do you understand the context about your databases, but also your emails with personal data on your intranet, or obviously also the internet, file servers, data lakes, paper, hard drives. Um, is it just going to give you information about metadata or is it looking at content? Is it sensitive, which ups the risk? Is it structured and structured that it will cover? Is it, what about your false positives and negatives? What level is that? But this isn't even the end of the story. You've got the same challenges for your uh, service external IT. You've got the same challenges for your cloud vendors or probably these days, more like this. You've got your remote workforce, everything. There's not really a boundary. So hopefully what I've illustrated here or what I'm trying to illustrate is it's a massive challenge of uncertainty and collaboration within the business to get you to the point where you understand your core processing. You need a point to start and you need to know your priorities. Because this green portion of fully automated data discovery, it's only one third, potentially, if you're lucky, of each of those circles for each of those domains. So one of the critical things in terms of audit and compliance is you need to understand your residual risk. It doesn't matter if you can't cover the whole piece. It doesn't matter if there's a gap in your tooling jigsaw, as long as you understand what it is. But you need to get to the point to be able to understand and a tool doesn't do that for you. A tool will focus on what it can fix. It doesn't help you get your arms around the bigger picture of what you actually need to govern. So how did we do with this automated data processing? Well, we solved about a third of the problem of listing the data we're processing, likely with the requirements gathering, implementation, tuning, finding someone to answer questions in far too much time, maybe a year, maybe two years. Well, that was all of the resource and time you had to do your entire comp compliance program. And all you have is half an idea of how much data is in which system. This is, this is being unfair to some very, very good tools are out there, but you need the context of your data governance maturity and your understanding of your data processing estate and your stakeholders lined up in order to cope with it. So needless to say, you're not solving much of a problem. It's another way of showing you these, these are some of the line items in potentially a whole data protection program. And that reminded me of something. As soon as I started to become aware of Wardley Maps, this is really, it's a very detailed slide. It's very wordy. I'm happy to share these slides, um, but this is, um, the Sun Tzu cycle that uh, shows you the elements that you need to consider when you're looking at strategy. Um, and really, I was looking at all of them. I was looking at, you know, are we in a position to take advantage of this? Are we mature enough? Do we have capacity to do it now? How do we get there if we, if we don't? What are the external factors? A massive drive to be compliant by a particular date. Um, and also a tooling frenzy because it was comforting to have that. Um, if we can't do that, can we pivot? And if we optimize for all that, what do we achieve? And is it the right stuff? So this isn't, this isn't a polished map. This, is, this isn't a demonstration of, you just need to get stuck in and try. And I wouldn't recommend anyone takes me as a tutor for mapping. This is me at the beginning of my mapping journey. So um, yeah, <laughs> this is the map. <laughs> My principle for mapping this, because we are looking at all of the information inputs and the things that need to contribute to in terms of expertise and time and all the um, things that are dependent upon each element that contributes towards being able to evidence data protection compliance, because the need driving this is the board needing to evidence data protection compliance. And what's happening is the, um, the marketing noise around automated data discovery was drowning out the bigger picture of what evidencing data protection compliance actually means. So this was the first step in trying to put back that context. So you have your record of processing activity, your data mapping and your data discovery, which is really what you get out of the box from this tool. We all know that you need to have exception management and man manual audit to work out all those do you know if it's personal? Do you know if it's compliant questions? You need local awareness to do that. You need a racy worked out so people know some of that is part of their job. You need a triage. You need to be able to work out what your priorities are to aim this at. You don't roll something like this out across the entire estate and have a to-do list as long as the Amazon 
um, that never gets done. You, you look at what exception management and outputs look like. And you're always working with, ideally, but in tension with, all of the more mature commoditized things on the right hand side. You're working with all the revenue generating functions trying to still carry on with their job. So my next stage was to work out, well, what can you actually start to move on in this space? Well, this is a picture of all the things that you're relying upon the rest of the business to give you from, from the data mapping point of view. Um, it's just simplifying it down to all the things we can't really influence, things that are Im important to make it work that, that aren't really under data protections control. So there's some substantial inputs there which we can't do much about. So there's another lens to look at that through. This lens is saying, what, what stuff can we lay groundwork for? And at this stage, I've removed automated data processing because it was actually influencing so little of the picture. I've reverted back to looking at the actual need, which is to demonstrate data protection compliance. So I've looked at the things that the data protection or security team can start to lay groundwork for change to do with. Really, they cannot start to change data collection points, change management, customer journeys and supply selection. That is part woven into, in the business context I was looking in, which was corporate, very, very immovable resistant change environment. So you can lay a lot of groundwork. It's an awful lot of upfront work to, to, to be able to start to demonstrate compliance. You need to have these things in place and working. But when it comes to actually implementing it, most of those things cannot be implemented unless you have the buy-in, unless you've identified the parts that the rest of the business contribute into it. So this was demonstrating to stakeholders, we can't do this without you. We can lay the groundwork, but we can't do this without you. We've, we need to have support to do the upfront work to enable it to be as painless, simple, quick and easy as possible to collaborate with us to bring you the picture of data protection compliance. And that's really sort of looking at the what goes on in the back end that adds the extra layers of value to mapping. It's really understanding the environment you're delivering it into. There really wasn't a lot of appetite because we were in a massive sales push, a, a really big strategic drive to evolve the business. So there was very little appetite to change supplier selection and change processes because so much was changing. So many suppliers were being onboarded. Um, there was no one with really spare capacity and time in the business to support that implementation phase. Um, the security triage that was usually mainly lacking, by which I mean working out the things that make something a priority, which makes something a high inherent risk, that needed to be put in place to direct effort for all steps of this. There wasn't a lot of appetite to do that either. Um, and for all of the understanding that GDPR was a big deal, there also was an awful lot of fear about the changes that was bringing. There was really concern about how much the marketing database was going to have to go. Um, and that was driving a lot of defensiveness, an incredible amount of inertia and outright um, conflict with the attempts of the, of the program. Um, so it was then trying to delve down to where can we nudge? Where can we try and impact this situation a little bit? So we stripped away all those chaotic lines to show you where things were least mature and where things needed to move the furthest. And the things that had the most connections to them, which were the things with the clouds in in the first place, were data protection awareness, people actually understanding which part of this was their job and the triage piece needed to be far more mature essentially existing within the structures and processes in the business. And they also needed to be uplifted to a far higher level of visibility. We also needed to improve maturity for data protection impact assessments, because if you're gonna bring stakeholders on board, they need to understand um, why. And data protection impact assessment drives out the context and the risks for high risk stuff. Europa needs to be more mature, but that is actually going to be a secondary effect of a lot of the other uplift. And data protection risk management, most of the time in businesses you're delivering this stuff into, the risk matrix doesn't even talk about impact on data subjects. So you need, that's a big cultural shift that you need to move as long, as well as mechanisms to, even if it's objective, have some consistent scaling for the level of data protection risk. That is very much not a mature area globally right now still. The concept of harms are very immature and not very helpful for our 
job of trying to incorporate these things into a risk matrix. And breach management, you, you cannot avoid having the stall set out if something goes wrong while you're in the midst of this. It needs to be reasonably mature and at least bring it up to speed with your security incident management, plug it into what you have. So what did, what did this achieve? This picture I could not have put together from a standing start. I needed the pre-existing maps to understand this context, to be able to paint the strategic development picture. I needed to create these maps to be able to paint the picture that didn't include automated data discovery in the first instance. We ended up with commitment after this mapping exercise and conversations to invest in raising awareness and the triage in the RACI. They put on hold the plans to buy automated data discovery. Um, but the hiccup is the things that were surfaced as is typical with something like um, data discovery and identifying a risk, understanding what you don't know is the messengers tend to get shot especially in large businesses where people have paid lip service to these kind of developments over years when the budget cycle has come around again and perhaps things started were never maintained. Um, but certainly there was a across the board uplift in awareness that smoothed the ride for, the, for what was then done. But the lessons learned for me, both from a mapping point of view and from um, a business management and strategy point of view in, in governance was um, you have to find out who has skin in the game and working out a racy and getting people to sign on the dotted line for that is, is essential. And a bit like mapping, the, the document you end up with with a racy isn't the point, it isn't the value, it's the journey, it's the conversation, it's understanding what pressures everyone else is working under. You have to have means to triage and work out what's important. And in terms of my map as opposed to Petra's, for what I was trying to achieve, it was trying to demonstrate chaos. So chaos is fine. But you need to understand the battles that you can fight, which is what it helped me to understand. So I could pull back to the core of what was changeable and who actually was in a position to be accountable to change it. And, and the last point is really my main takeaway. I need more maps. Every one of those points actually has their own sub maps for processes and contributory technology, et cetera, and various levels of maturity. But chuck it all in, work out your winnable battles, focus in and then build back out. And that is uh, probably um, quite a lot of talking, quite a lot of detail, but that, that's what I wanted to say in my 15 minutes. Wow, and dead on time. Um, really good, Sarah. Uh, thought provoking, um, really informative as well. I, I suppose uh, my first question would just be the complexity of, this, of the domain that you're in. Um, I'm wondering about where the input comes from how many people were con contributing in your maps were they the same people contributing and did you general get generally get agreement around um components especially where the component is the person you're discussing i won't touch on the fact that you've put sales in the commodity utility area i think that's a discussion we could have privately <laughs> uh, yeah that, that that kind of drives to my question um tell us just a little bit about the, about the story of conflict around the mapping process and around actual the data you were getting in um, to inform the maps. Yeah, I mean, the map very much came later in this because, as I said, I'm I'm very much a baby mapper um, and uh, somebody who's a lot further down the journey would have a lot an enormous amount to teach me about things I've I've missed and, and techniques I've used. But um, the people who came to the table were the people who I'd already won some battles of convincing them of the worth of refocusing. Um, so the conflicts came prior to that. Um, it was in large part people who had bet the farm on the data they needed to deliver things in the business, especially in HR and marketing and in sales, where they foresaw their strategic pre-existing strategic plans being endangered. So the people I brought to the table were the people I'd already convinced of the value of refocusing. Um, once we came to the table for mapping, there was the typical thing that you have with all kinds of things in risk management, in security and data protection. Everybody felt that their strategic aims were the most important and they all felt that theirs were more mature than I thought they were in terms of um, personal data, visibility and management. So it was a massive diplomatic exercise. It was being 
sort of um, uh, iron fist in velvet glove. I don't, I don't really want to use a Thatcher quote, sorry. Um, but anyway, it was trying to be very gently respectful of, of what they brought to the table. So I ended up with the person who usually dealt with compliance and marketing, ditto for HR. Um, I had my usual IT business partner in the room. Um, I had the CRO came and spent time because they had perspective across operational risk. Um, and also procurement from a vendor governance point of view and someone from the project management office. Those were the key, key per people in the room um, and me bringing a data protection focus. Um, and that chaotic map was the outcome, but we did have five versions of that that I just had to eventually draw a line and say, this is the one we're going with um, because it doesn't have to be perfect as long as the narratives are consistent that are coming out of it from all our perspectives. Interesting. So the, for me, the conflict is the thing that, show, that shows that the map is doing something. So it's either conflict because of the results and how different um, the recommendations effectively the map gives an organization are from what they thought before to the conflict in, um, in the actual discussion uh, where people are having conflict in terms of actually determining where things should be, what, how things should be interpreted. I figure that the conflict is a really good measure that there is a problem and that you're fixing it because you're sort of bringing the right people, people together. Um, Petra and Dennis, what can we learn from that? Either one of you. <laughs> well, I, I'm I think with these guys right now, so I'm a little bit nervous about what they're going to say. <laughs> Well, no, I look, I think it's massively impressive, right? I, I think in a, in a weird way, right? I, I feel that I map more in my head than, um, than sometimes on paper because I think I internalize a lot of the ideas. But I, I feel that what, what you created here and, and the way you presented it, it's, it's a great way to then have those conversations, right? You know, like the, 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 the next step of this is the details, but the, the details almost, they will sort themselves, you know, by just talking about it, right? But one thing I would say is that I feel that these maps, um, and this is where I, maybe I, 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 I expand them more than some, sometimes Simon would, is I view that these maps are also a great way to, to map your strategy, right? Like you, you should be able to look at that map and your strategy should be almost obvious uh, because especially once you start show, tracking movements and I'm gonna move this map from here to there, and I'm gonna move that one from there to there, or this won't be possible until this happens, and maybe even show the evolution, right? Um, I think as we did in some cases, right? I think it's it's super powerful to present information like this. So yeah, no, amazing work, Sarah. Yeah, um, I, I thought it was quite impressive. So I just wondered, you've shown the map to the CEO, right? Um, we showed the outcome to the CEO with, yeah, the map was in the deck. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering what was the reaction um, of the CEO um, to that and, and how well um, did the CEO to kind of take it as a kind of means to present information? It, dramatically sceptical because it was the first time they'd been anywhere near it. But that final slide where I stripped all the lines away and, and showed them the points of maturity they were and he recognised that those were the nexus points in my previous diagrams that was then, ah, that's useful. That was, that was the reaction. I'm not swearing it was a buy-in. It, was, it wasn't there yet, <laughs> but it did, it resulted in sign-off for the decision of the change of direction for spend. Did so, the job. <laughs> did the job. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, we don't have any questions in the chat and I'm, I'm, I'm figuring most people are so spellbound by the presentation, um, they haven't remembered to go in and type. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask you a question if you don't mind um, from a previous conversation we had, but something that you touched on, which was um, culture. So you're dealing with organizations with lots of different silos and those come, up, come across with their own individual cultures, whether that's uh, speed of movement, whether that's openness to change. Um, it, it never expect it, it's, it's not escaped my attention that you're a lady as well. Um, and I know that you come across this from a, a data um, sort of focus. So I wanted you just to talk around being in the security privacy space 
um, and decisions that you made along the way. Um, so really, really, I'm trying to get at the um, culture of cybersecurity um, generally. And just wonder if you can if you can touch on that in any way. Okay, I think probably the most um, the most useful way I can I can broach that is my journey. I came from IT desktops networks, um, sitting on server room floors with console cables, designing and hardening networks into um, a, a joint responsibility, injecting some ISO twenty seven thousand and one overlay into that kind of thing but very much IT and then InfoSec and then eventually I, I moved into governance because um, I don't I'm not going to claim this is gendered but I could see the join points I could see that we needed to have a common language and a common set of metrics that we could bring together to a central point across different disciplines and I could see that nobody was talking to anybody else um, and I really took one for the team I decided that because everywhere I was, people were being consistently reactive and shouting about not having enough staff, but never able to evidence how many they needed and why. So I set myself up as a governance person when usually governance people were coming out of the IT general control space into security. I was coming out of security into the governance space. Um, and I think I don't, I, again, I'm, I'm loath to suggest there's a gendered element of that there, but I was very focused on the users behind the data as well. That's something that drove me to try and understand the impacts of what we were doing. And that naturally lent itself to a conversation about wider risk as well. I think that's what drove my journey. Um, I'm also a natural diplomat. I'm a problem solver. I'm a diagnostician and I'm a diplomat. Um, and those things lent themselves to this space as well. Um, uh, and seeing a bigger picture um but i i had some of sometimes that wasn't a choice sometimes i was seen as non-technical so i was put in these places anyway so it was the some of it was a path of least resistance too yeah i have this image of um you going around with this very uh, confident and informed um sort of persona into all of these different domains starting fights and i just wondered how that how that went along <laughs> and how you're emotional <laughs> Or the mental health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I suppose networks is kind of the dark side of the dark side in security. So that was that was a good starting point. Then I became security. Then I became risk, which is the alternative dark side of the dark side. Um, uh, if we are the grit in the security wheels, according to many people, although that's not how I operate. If you're doing it right, you're not. Um, what I would do is I would seek evangelists because. The aim was it always for someone to realise it was their idea. So I would find somebody as an interim translator who spoke the language and understood the pain of the person I was trying to address if they weren't willing to empathise with my aims. So I would use them to both educate me about the pressures that the person I was communicating with, what pressure they were under and the context they were operating in and also educate the other person on my behalf. And when I knew I was walking into a really contentious meeting, I used to always take what I call my starter evangelist with me. Um, and oftentimes they were the people who had been the most vehement objectors who I could see that they hadn't got it. So I would spend enormous amounts of time empathizing with where, where they were and bringing them with me and then using them to bridge the gap to other stakeholders in the business. No, brilliant. We've got a little bit of time just uh, for a couple of comments that have come in and a question. Um, then we'll have to jump, jump into dinners, although I feel we could talk about this for, for an, another hour. Um, so for Mark Walker, Sarah, that battle scarred real world example was massively helpful to, to me as a newbie, especially the stripping back to communicate your key points and arrive at a plan. Thank you. Um, from James Abley. That was a great talk with lots of powerful points to take away. I'll be watching that back a few times. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and a question from Brandon Knowlton. I hope I pronounced that correctly. It's uh, for either speaker. I was struck in both of your maps by the way that some items are evolving quickly and some not. How do you model or respond to those changes with de dependent entities? I'm going to add a bit to that, which is about your methods of attack. Um, so you showed 
clear sort of decision making, clear movement on your map. I was just wondering around things like openness, um, education, what, what would you say your methods of attack were for solving problems? Um, I mean, from my point of view, in, in a mapping context, the method for solving problems would have been a, one of the sub maps to this, I would have had um, it, I would have had a, a I, I didn't do it because the it wasn't where the engagement ended up. I wasn't it wasn't within my remit. But for for raising awareness and embedding the racy, both of which are fundamentally awareness raising parts of of, of that map, um, I would have I would have been mapping what the um, maturity was in terms of understanding of the topic currently, um, and I would have been looking at the um, historical resistance to change and tolerance for education in the business um, and also the, the senior stakeholder openness to investing adequately in that kind of awareness activity um, because all of that context would have dictated how far I could move how fast um, and then you really I would have brought back all those outcomes into the map to find out well which of the dependent things can I now not do because I can't move at the speed I wanted to with this with the awareness raising so you need to delve down to the next layer with all those items to find out if you have any showstoppers or blockers in terms of ability to move and appetite for movement. Um, and then re-engineer if you have to, pivot if you have to. Well, so that's taking a lot farther than I ever do. Um, getting into really the tactical uh, decisions as well as the large sort of broad um, strategic things that you can do the, the low hanging fruit. I mean I wasn't getting into those weeds either <laughs> Damien to be fair this is this is if if they had then tasked me to do it that's that's what I would have been doing and I think we all do that on the hoof anyway if we find out we've hit a blockage we'll we'll just rejig to cater. No thank you Sarah we have run out of time um you've got a couple of questions in the chat um if you wouldn't mind having a look at them and answering them I want to move to Dennis who I know has prepared a, a talk for us today as well Dennis do you want to introduce yourself and your talk yeah um can you hear me okay you're yeah, great I think we've got an echo one of your other mics is on yeah all right okay um Actually, let me do this. Uh, sorry, I was just I was trying to see that. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen, and um, you should be able to hear me. Okay, yeah. Hey, great, thanks, Dennis. Great. Um, so yeah, so I'm the I'm the CISO and CTO of uh, of Glasswall, um, which is um, actually a, a security company. And um, actually, sorry, this is bugging me. All right. And, um, and, and I, I have to say that these days, I, I highly recommend if you're in security to also be the, the CTO because it's a great way to uh, make things happen and to push security uh, uh, throughout the, the whole company. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of mapping. I have introduced by mapping actually by Tony Richards, which I think was on, you might still be in, uh, the, the presentation. And I was very privileged for Tony at the time to invite um, Simon to, to join on the Open Security Summit that I was kind of helping to organize. And then Simon's been a participant since, so I was actually able to also learn from Simon. And I kind of did a lot of paradigm shifts throughout. So what I want to walk you through in this presentation is my one of my views on the kind of why context uh, is your crown rules and why you, know, you need to apply uh, context in in the mapping that you do. So I'm going to walk you through a story. So I want to talk about the, the kind of a big epiphany that I had um, when I realized that you know when I was looking at threat models, worldly maps was one of the things that we can use to really unlock the the threat model and to really understand um, you know kind of the next steps and where to focus. So I'm going to use the Glasswall uh, proxy product, which is one of the things we're working on. Fundamentally, it's basically this. The user clicks on a file from SharePoint. You know, there's a proxy that intercepts it, sends it to Glasswall, um, and maybe to an AV, and Glasswall basically rebuilds the file into a new file. So that's kind of the workflow. And we're building this, and I'll walk you to the architecture. So basically, this, you know, you pick the file, sends to the ICAP server. The adaptation you know, system is basically what it does everything because the ICAP is the internet content 
adaptation protocol, and then there is, you know, transactions monitoring policies. Uh, we actually, this is, a, this is a very good example, this part here of how we commoditizing a large chunks of this, uh, of this uh, solution. I can actually say that doing worldly maps already helped us to create a much better architecture. So this is, for example, one of the cases where we mapped the dependencies between the multiple um, deployment models, and we're already building something that will run all the way from, um, you know, anywhere you can run Kubernetes to AWS, Azure, or any cloud provider. So we minimize a lot of the dependencies and we build a quite a scalable solution. This is kind of the flow. You get the file, it goes to proxy, hits the load balancer, the ICAP server, putting queues and, and storage. Everything gets processed in here. The file gets rebuilt safely and then it goes back to the user. And, and this is the more interesting one. This is the scalable Kubernetes architecture, multiple regions deployment. Um, and then, you know, this is kind of the flow to actually, you know, make sure the whole thing, you know, happens at the scalable. We're designing this so you basically we can handle, you know, dozens or hundreds of thousands of pods happening in, in parallel. So massive scalability. So from a security point of view, what you do is you take this diagram and then you start to create a thread model. So you start to map the architecture, map the threads, map what's going on and put it in JIRA. So this is very close to my heart, this part here. This is a great, uh, and actually Petra and, and the team worked on this. So you actually start to take the, the systems and you start to map out the, the, the risks, the vulnerabilities, the assets, every, et cetera, and it becomes a gigantic graph which is kind of what it is, right? So if you look at table, it's fundamentally a graph. This is how we represent. So in this case, every yellow box here is a Jira ticket and there's a relationship between them. And then this is the, uh, the thread model that we actually created, which, you know, if you've done thread modeling, you look quite familiar where you have, um, you know, trusted boundaries, you have communication flows, et cetera, right? Flowing through. Now, uh, and this was then actually, I believe, doing the thread modeling tool. Now, uh, Microsoft, the thread modeling tool, but you could do it with Visio with others, which is kind of what most people use or draw IO. Now, the problem with this thing, right, is that most of thread models are just works of art. And I wrote this really you know, uh, you know, interesting article a while back where I really kind of go to town on, on sort of like the, the, the need to use dot language, but also why something like Visio, which is can be used to create diagrams like this, uh, don't scale, right? And fundamentally is it takes a lot of time. They create it from somebody's interpretation of reality. They become a work of art. They can look quite beautiful, but at, at, at the end of the day, you know, their interpretation, they're not created from dynamic data, which is a massive problem. The layout is pixel based, which basically means that you actually need to put the things where you want them to be. You're going to be locked to a design convention. It's very easy to mix abstraction layers. They store in binary or XML format. Again, it's very hard to diff. They mix data and design in the same file and they're very hard to update and they're not an accurate representation of reality and they're not used every day, right? And they're usually not mapped, but in most cases they never map. So uh, the, the, this is almost the reason why very few teams have up-to-date documentations and also why a thread model, you know, even after a while becomes out of date because it doesn't reflect the changes when the design or the changes in coding, right? So I, I kind of think that, first of all, the first thing you need to do is you need to move a thread model to a plan to ML. And this is the big, also one of the epiphanies of how it maps is that, you know, you can do maps on paper, when it works well, but if you really want to scale maps, you need to start with graphs, right? You need to really start with graphs. You need to start with something like this. So this is the, this, a variation of that same um, diagram where you could see the request goes from the user to the proxy, you know, via the proxy, hits the ICAP server, puts on here, that starts the pod. The pod takes the file from the store, then writes events, then puts the result here, puts it, and then, you know, there's this concept of non-compliant file service, which can I be our interpretation of a third party, and then the administrative cluster. So you can see here, three different clusters already work, working together. You know, we, we commoditize, in a way, that, or uh, productizing that, that concept. Now, you can see here, right, you can, the power of this is you can actually write text, and it becomes like this. So this eventually, this should even be done programmatically, but this is already much easier to maintain, much easier to diff. And, and I, although I don't control the actual design, it, it already gives you a good sense of what's happening. So the next step is to create a version where you actually, you know, create, you know, this is kind of uh, left to right. This is more of a top down, having an anchor at the top, and you can see the same sequence of events from the SharePoint website, which is the target uh, environment to the user. Now, uh, the problem with this, and uh, so final one thing. So this is, again, this is how you write it. And you can see that, that this creates, the, you know, that. Now, the question is, is the thread modeling a map? 
right? So if we look at Simon Wallace's definition of a map, which I think is great, is, is a visual context, position, anchor, movement, and component. So you could say it's visual, yes, has a bit of context, kind of, yes. Positioning, no, there's no position. If I move this one over here and, um, and I move, you know, another element over there, you know, it doesn't have. The anchor, just about have one, not really. You kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's easy when you go top to bottom, but you could probably argue that has a bit of an anchor at the top, but there's no movement. Again, there's no, there, there's, you know, you can, it's, it's hard to now apply because position doesn't matter. It's hard to say if I move this over there, if I move that, and then he has components, but it's, it's definitely not a map. So let's make position matter. So if we take the original design and we make it like this, so let's say level one, two, three, and four, where you know we went from this one on the left to the one on the right, you could see that now position matter. Now, if I move the proxy ICAP to level one or SharePoint to level three, now that will mean something. The question is, what does level one, two, and three, and four actually mean, right? So let's look at a really cool example. And actually, actually before we look at that, one of the things you could also do with this, and, and this is probably the first question that you can answer with the map, very especially with the more traditional worldly map, is what do you build, what do you buy, what do you outsource, right? So if I have something that looks like this, right, which one do I do it, right? You know, there is, um, you know, I, do I do this one? Do I do that one? Do I do that one? You know, this is where there's that funny slide from, from Simon where, you know, you, you can do it in Elvish, right? Or you can do it in Klingon, right? You know, which one do I do, right? You know, at, at this level, you don't have enough context. But if I told you that, you know, for example, from a maturity of the individual components, this is what they look like, right? Then it becomes easy to understand what I should outsource, what I maybe I should buy, and what I should build. So you can see here, you now I moved into the commodity the things that just happens, the stuff that today there's a, pro a product that we're using, open source or not. And then, you know, the bits that at the moment, there's no product to actually do it, where in, in these cases, the ones that we actually do encoding. This is also very powerful because what you want to see when you do development is that you don't want to, for example, spend time developing queues or, or data stores when there's already a good product in the market for it. So, you know, if I, if I look at where, where the, the teams are working on, I would actually expect to see the, the main development to occur here on the left, nothing here on the right, right? So this is kind of the more traditional. Let's look at security. Here's a cool example, right? If I look at this again, now which, which bits handle confidential data? Which ones I should care about? Now, here is a, a better view. So now this is a view that says every one of these boxes will touch, in this case, the file from SharePoint. Now, this matters because um, I now need to know that I need to apply, you know, for example, the stuff that Sarah was talking about, you know, to every one of these boxes, it's important to now be able to understand that, you know, um, you know, we need to protect it. But the other thing that we also make here a big jump is we're saying that the logging data has no confidential data. So that's a massive jump where now we have something even from a security point of view that we want to make sure that is correct. We want to make sure that, okay, the assumption here is that the logging and the stuff that takes loggings has no confidential data, which, you know, it takes a lot of work, but reduces the attack surface. Now, let me just, um, fast, last example, I really like this one from a security point of view, which is, you know, when you're applying security, again, you look at this is where should I put my security efforts? Where should I make sure that uh, I can actually, um, you know, uh, be strategic on how I apply risk decisions. So here's a, a view where I'm going to show you how fast can you patch each of the solutions. So the logic here is that, for example, in this case, you can't patch, let's say the source code doesn't exist. You know, you're using a binary, you know, you cannot actually put a patch on this one. This one will take weeks to patch, right? At best case, this might take days, this might take hours. Now, what's interesting about this is that suddenly you get a sense of what you need to protect. You get also get a sense of risk. So if this was reality, in this case, it's not, I just made it up. But if this was reality, that rebuild store is a massive risk, right? Why is that store different than, for example, that store, right? Or that store, right? So basically, 
you know, we need to understand, but also why is it taking me weeks to patch, for example, this, you know, is it because maybe the CI pipeline is not mature enough? Maybe, you know, it's something more and more custom. So it becomes very interesting to understand, you know, maybe SharePoint, you know, depends on Microsoft to, to push the fix, right? The proxy ICAP actually depends on the appliance. So there's a bunch of stuff that you can move here with better automation and better processes, but others that you can't. So you then need to understand even when you're doing a security incident or when you're mapping your security practices, where do you actually focus? And one of the things that I found sometimes that we do in security, and this is where it goes back to the whole thing, context matters. Sometimes you find that when you look at this or when you look at, you know, maybe the, the original mappings, you know, where you have that, the security teams tend to work where um, you actually get lots of traction. So if you go back to the design, the security teams tend to work in places where you actually have uh, a lot of a lot of you know traction, you know basically you, know, you can make changes, people respond to it, and again, if you go back to the original design, I don't have context to make that decision. So if you compare now this this map here on on the right, especially where I'm highlighting with the mouse, with this one, you could see that the last one I have context to know where I should focus, and the interesting angle here is you might find that because you can push a security fix in hours to this ones, I, ironically, this might not be your highest risk because the other question you need to ask is how much damage can be done in hours or days or weeks? So you might have what you think a lower risk uh, system versus let's say the ICAP or the adaptation service, but the reality is this one, if it gets exploited, we can fix it very fast. If the original store gets exploited, we're going to take weeks to, to patch, right? So this is where, you know, context really matters. And, 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 and with maps, you can really uh, start to understand this. And by the way, you know, this is a worldly map. I just, you know, I just put the things at the top because I plan to ML, uh, which is what I was using. And also my, the, the view of this is that this is, you know, you want to create this programmatically and eventually this should be created actually from code. And um, thank you. That was my presentation. Wow, Dennis. Um, could you go back Any to questions? halfway and, and just start again? I, <laughs> you took us through so much. Um, that was really, really good. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Dennis? Hello? Yes. Oh, sorry. Hi there. Yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear okay, yeah. No, nah, good stuff. I was saying thank you. That was really, um, that was bewildering. That was really super fast. And as I was writing down questions, um, by the time I got halfway through and looked up at the presentation, I was now wondering about the relevance of my question again, but really, really good stuff. So um, first thing, uh, we were talking about, uh, in, the, in the last talk, we were talking about um, axes, uh, determining what to measure how. Um, that seems like a huge part of what you do when you're mapping. Um, so really thinking about the context and really framing it right. Interesting part to me was when you started sort of creating your own bottom axes as to, I think we were looking at, um, you know, which things are easier to patch. And so I was wondering, um, when you start going to that second level that Sarah was going to, where you start doing um, sub maps of specific components, yeah. did you start finding um, basically commonalities, new patterns as to the reason why something was slow to patch? Yeah, so the, the thing about maps, and, and, and this, is, this is an area that I don't think we've done enough work uh, you know, as a community, is that we need a scalable way that you can do maps within maps within maps, right? The, the bottom line is that every dot in a map should be a map in itself, right? Because there should be a reason why that dot is there. And that fundamentally is a map, right? So, so I think when you look at that, you know, the reality, you know, the answer is yes, right? You, you have patterns because fundamentally you, you also, you know, there's a reason why I say this takes a week and that takes a day, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and actually the reason why it takes a week versus a day, because there's going to be attrition. There's going to be something in there that prevents you from going super fast. Because clearly when you have compliance as code, when you have full CI, CD pipelines, when you have full automation, you can patch very quickly, right? The problem is in most software development environments, you know, especially with multiple parts, you find that there's a lot of attrition. And, and this sometimes, what I realized was, uh, there's, there's some interesting angles where you can have something that looks like a commodity or a product 
from the user point of view, that below is a massive shit show, right? That below is like, you know, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, lots of chewing gum, lots of things that were barely done, lots of pioneer stuff that if you think about never actually evolved, you know, and it's still the original code, it's still the original practices, it's still the original, you know, behaviors that because you apply almost like a veneer on front of it that looks very professional, looks very good, looks very nice, right? It, um, you know, it, you, you get away with it, right? And, I, and that, what I like about maps is again, maps, just like security, right? The, the nice thing of when you do a thread model is that you can go deep, right? So for me, the big epiphany was that a, 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 Basically, if you apply worldly maps to a thread model, now you have context. Now you can make decisions. Now you can, you know, those dots and those lines in your thread models, which is basically how the system works, make a lot more sense. And then you can, you can drive a, almost like a question or, or a story, right? And, and that's kind of my view on this. You, you have to start with a story that you want to tell, and then the maps, you know, where help you to visualize and to understand that story that you want to say. Yeah, it starts with the domain knowledge that can then give you the situational awareness, as in you can't yeah. have the situational awareness if you don't know the domain. Absolutely. Um, interesting. So I work in enterprise software sales, so I know all about the concept of lipstick on a pig. Yeah. Um, what I yeah, what I would say is that that explains also that uh, phenomenon where you see something that is sort of a high-level component suddenly move from a commodity to the left side and you realize it's usually some subcomponent that has dramatically changed the way thing that operates so something that effectively looks like a commodity becomes an innovation not because of what it is in itself but because of a subcomponent that has changed or moved so, so one of the things that you know and this again i i have some debates with some of the guys from the world map community is my, my my view on on the evolution is that you know and, and this is this is a very cool concept right if you take a particular element that you could say is a product today, right? When you start using that product is in your world is a genesis because you don't know how to use it, right? You, you could say that EC2 is a commodity. That's great. But if you never use EC2 for, from your point of view or for your team point of view is, um, is a genesis. The only difference is, is that the more to the right that component is, the less attrition you will have. So the bottom line is that, you know, if you don't have something like EC2 and it's still a product or, you know, requires somebody to build those things, then although you still start on Genesis, you will hit that, that barrier much sooner than if it's EC2. But the reality is that, you know, every time you start something, it's always Genesis. And then there's the evolution. The question is, how fast can you go and how fast can teams, you know, operate? You know, and, and driving change and, and visualizing things like this becomes really hard. Yeah, I just saw the comment from Ken, 3D map. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of actually potential of creating 3D visualizations and, and multiple dimensions, right, of, of worldly maps, right? Because, you know, when you, when you look at, you know, especially maps within maps, I think there's a lot of power of, of really understanding, you know, those interconnections between the systems. Yeah, there's a technical question from Josh um, Sharebound, I think, of, I think that's a correct pronunciation. For the patching or data classification examples, was there also a vertical position significance? No. Are, not really. And by the way, um, I'm just going to keep the room open for just the last few questions in chat. Uh, no, in this case, the, the vertical is just a sequence of events. It's just, a, the, um, it's just a, you know, this it leads to this. It's almost like the data flow um, of... if. Of the, in fact, of this, and in fact, a really cool map I created once was a map that actually had two anchors, one at the top, one at the bottom, because I found that going from the top back to the top creates problems in certain workflows. So mm -hmm. I, I end up creating a map that starts, in fact, you know, as you can see on that one, right, the, the map starts with a file on SharePoint and ends in the user, right? And what's interesting is that the maturity of those could actually not be, you know, um, man, might be different. But so I quite like the maps that have, that tell you a story. You know, this needs this, or this does this, does this, does that, or, or what the needs, and then then you move it to the evolution. So it's basically the axis of almost data or or, or packets or sequence of events and evolution. I mean, from my point of view, that there, there was um, there was a, an impact of top to bottom. It wasn't 
100% consistent because there's only so much room on the screen that you can put stuff in. Um, but it was how visible it is to the CEO, in my example, as the, as the user, um, the stuff that wasn't as visible as it should be where I indicated it should be moving up the stack to be yeah. far more prominent and the stuff that naturally they don't need to know how, they just want to know what the outcomes are. Yeah. I think you, you get that kind of by default, right? Once you have this uses this, uses this, uses this, then um, then you actually have um, you know that evolution, right? In fact, what I, what, I, what I would love to do, which we're going to try to do in a project, in fact, in this project, and by the way, the project we I just showed is it's all open source, right? And uh, and I think there was just a question about you know some examples in Plan to ML and, and Creative Commons. Um, absolutely, like we, we, we're going to publish that. So that's going to be on the, one of the Glasswall repos or ping, ping me, ping Petra um, for the links on that one. Um, but I, I really like the idea that we, we're going to try to create these maps that actually start almost based on a C4 model. If you've seen where it talks about context, components, um, containers, and then code. Um, but there's a, there's a really cool concept that I want to explore, which is you actually programmatically create the map so you can go all the way from the high level components and then you start to zoom in, you go all the way to the actual source code. Because the source code, or at least the, the main parts of the source code, you should also be able to map it out, right? You should be able, there, there has to be a, in fact, Petra, for example, needs that, right? So Petra needs a map that tells her, for example, of those components, which ones need code review, right? In fact, once you go down a further level down, you know, Petra's team, doesn't scale to review every single pull request, right? You know, it, it, no security team can do that, right? Um, what you can do is you can say, here are the parts of the code, here are the parts of the application that I want to make sure that ironically, we introduce an attrition into it. We want to say, this is the ones that I care about. The other ones, for example, can go to production as fast as you can, right? It's not because you can automate that you should automate everything, right? Because especially from a security point of view, you know, if you automate everything, it means that you can push a vulnerability to production within hours, right? Which is, you know, not a good thing. So, so I think these maps, especially as you get more granularity, um, will give us a lot of situation awareness, and from a security point of view, allow us to make sure that we maximize the investments of what we do in security and understand, right? You know, and the data classification, Sarah, was a good example, right? That, that map is not complete, but it was interesting that in our design, we actually limited which boxes actually have confidential data by design, right? And that was a limitation that we introduced into the system so that we can then put the security requirement to say, we don't care about that, 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 and that, right? Of course, you know, pen test has to validate it. We make sure the code review is validated, but it was a, it's a good example of almost saying, you know, I, I know I want these guys, for example, not to be toxic, right? I want, you know, oh, yeah. data here, you know, non-confidential data over there. And you can also do it around, right? You can say, actually, I want more of my data to be public versus confidential, right? Depends. That's a good example of, it's not really evolution, it's more, you know, a, a spectrum between, and, and I, I even then from critical to low, right? Vulnerabilities, you know, I view that as a spectrum of things. No, oh, brilliant. Um, and I have to close the room, but uh, I'm dealing at the moment with a customer who is asking that broad question. We like this open data idea. What should we be sharing? Should we just go open first? And no, 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 no. Let's let's map everything and let's use the mapping process to actually determine how valuable everything is and really how you should deal with it appropriately. Look, thanks so much. Oh, <laughs> My, my, the thing I would say is, if you can, the more you open, the easier it gets, right? So there, there is the problem with especially confidentiality. There's a mode where if you're not careful, everything becomes a secret. Everything becomes confidential because nobody wants to to take the view or to, to to make the call, right? I would say the model that is quite good is that you try to reduce to the limits what's confidential, and that actually means you know what to protect. Right? So that's why I like open as an open source, because I actually use it as a security strategy. My view is that the less secrets, you know, they exist, the, the less you have to worry about protecting them. No. The problem is most businesses have a different definition of what they consider secret or confidential or proprietary. There's, or there's, annoying, uh, there's annoying um, 
risk people um, who basically want to put you know grit into every single system. Oh no, 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 no! Look, risk, <laughs> risk is what allows you to go fast, right? So risk, when used correctly, right, is you know, is one of the biggest assets that you have in a company, right? In fact, if you look at fintech versus traditional banks, one of the reasons that the fintech has innovated is because they, they take a different view of risk, right? So if you look at most organizations, I actually think that, you know, risk, you know, when used correctly, will give you a huge amount of speed, just like brakes in cars, just like security features in cars, risk risk mappings and risk classifications and risk awareness allows you to make good calls. Right. And that's super critical. Right. You know, because the, the fundamentally each business needs to define their risk appetite. And there's a balance between what's ethical, what mm -hmm. makes sense. Parity right? and context. Absolutely. In context. Back to, back to the start. Yeah. Exactly. Right. But but that's a it's a risk, a business decision. Right. And, and that's why, again, I, I like openness because fundamentally all the players should understand the risk framework that you're using within that project most scandals or most problems occur when there's an asymmetry of information, right? When somebody thinks that you know, you're doing something with a certain level of security and you're not, or you should care about this and you don't, right? I think there's, there's a lot of value of saying, here's my risk appetite, here's what I accept, here's what I don't accept. So that means that within the risk appetite, the company can do you know, what you know, matches that. Beyond that, you don't want to allow the company or the or the teams to 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 you know operate above the risk appetite of the company or the organization, right? Um, to all the speakers, uh, and I think this will be a theme throughout the day. Um, your slides and any other sort of uh, supportive content that you might have have out there. I don't know what the correct forum is, but um, yeah, if you could just let everybody know whether or not your slides are available. Right. I think you know, you've got some specific asks for plant UML source. Yeah. Can you take that, that ask and just figure out where to put it? Because I, I think, you know, I, I think most of our slides are, we were going to share it, right? So uh, the question is just where we put it. So maybe, you know, pink Simon, and I, I don't know what the plan is. Who do we send it to? No problem. We'll, we'll find that out and I'll make sure we communicate that to everybody and um, where slides um, will be available. And I can put them on slide share too. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to put it on slide share, but I think it's for the attendees. It's, it's going to be good to um, to put it there. Brilliant. So everybody, there is a chat room. I'm in the presenters version of this platform. Um, although I've seen the room that you all see, there is a chat room. We're all being sort of encouraged to spend um, the time between talks within that. So I won't keep this room open. Um, any longer so that uh, we have complaints from Simon about uh, people not attending the chat room. But a really thank you to our speakers. Thanks to everybody for attending. Um, I think about three really, really great starts <laughs> as far as um, really interesting talks. Uh, I've all gone quite different directions um, in terms of looking at the overall theme of cybersecurity. I'm hoping everybody learned as much as me and has many sort of as many additional questions. Um, so please, yeah, go along to the to the uh, general chat room, and then we'll see you in the next round of talks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone.